Today on the My Lighting Seems to Be a Bit Funny Says podcast, I'll be discuss- discuss- <laughs> discussing <laughs> Apple creating transcripts for every single podcast. Good luck transcribing that and other stuff too, so go ahead and stick around. This last week, Apple sent out an email that announced that they are going to be creating transcripts for all of the podcasts in Apple Podcasts. This feature is not available yet, but when it does roll out this spring, it will be available in 170 countries. And if you don't understand what this means, Apple is going to auto-generate a text transcript of your show, which is going to allow anybody to read the entirety of your episode or really easily search an episode or while they're looking at the transcript, click on a certain word and jump to that point. So it is going to add that additional functionality and make it make your show a little bit more accessible. I want to point out a couple of things that Apple disclosed in this announcement. If you do want to read the entirety of that, by the way, I will link the Apple announcement in the episode notes and description. But once you upload your audio file to your podcast, that is going to generate that transcript. Then if you replace that audio file, It will not regenerate the transcript. So the transcript is going to be based on that initial upload. If you have a bunch of massive changes, it sounds as though you would likely need to delete that old episode and re-upload it. Or I suppose you could go in and then download the existing transcript to make some edits to it and then upload the transcript to your podcast host. And then that should override the Apple podcast transcript. But that seems to be the workaround there. And they will only generate the transcript seemingly based on this announcement once. Also, they will not transcribe the lyrics for music, so if you're hoping that it's going to make that lyric you don't understand finally legible, finally understandable, it's not. It's not going to do any of that. With that out of the way, if you have your show in Apple Podcasts and you want transcripts to go live on your show once this rolls out, go to your Podcast Connect page and read through the new terms of service and approve those because that is necessary for this to go live on your show. My understanding of the change is that it allows them to go ahead and go through your audio file and generate those transcripts. But if you want confirmation, go check out the Pod News Daily Show because James breaks down exactly what changes in the TOS. Overall, I think this is a positive change because it's making podcasts more accessible for more people if somebody is hard of hearing, if somebody is deaf, and they still want access to the content in your podcast. I think this is great. It's a podcasting 2.0 function or feature that has been out there for a while. Seeing it adopted by Apple is great. And some people are likely going to hate this because maybe they have said controversial stuff in the past. And this will make it very easy to search that out. (laughs) So I am sure people will say, I don't want this. I'm pulling my show from Apple Podcasts. But I think this is positive because it does make stuff more accessible. It gives more people access to the information you're sharing. And I view that as a positive. I will link the announcement in the episode notes and description. And I will also link the Pod News Daily Show in case you want to listen to James Cridlin's beautiful voice. That is it for the news. Now let's talk about what I have been testing. You've been watching and listening to it. Let's start with the visuals. The start of this show, I said, my lighting is a bit funny. I got my Philips Hue set up. I've had a few bulbs, but I got a few more for the studio. I don't know why. I had this urge to have a little bit of a funny lighting setup. And now it looks like I am in Tokyo. That's the preset that I used. And I have this very bright red light just shooting me in the face. (laughs) It is very difficult to do anything. I did notice something a little bit funny with this setup and it forced me to change the settings on my camera to avoid it. I shoot my videos in 30 FPS. My understanding is that your shutter speed ought to be at least 2x what your frame rate is. So since I shoot in 30 FPS, my shutter speed ought to be 160th 
I just set my shutter speed to 160 and at this shutter speed, what I noticed is the lights in the background had a bit of flicker to them, had a bit of jitter to them, and it was very, very distracting. I had this set up in one of my podcastage videos with the lights in the background and I couldn't stand it. The solution that I came up with was decreasing the shutter speed to 1 50th of a second. So I am not 2x what my frame rate is. I don't know if that is causing any kind of visual abnormalities. I don't know if it's causing any serious issues with the video. Maybe the motion blur is garbage, but I find whatever it does to the video less distracting than this constant flicker in the background with these lights. Maybe I could increase the shutter speed from 1 60th to 1 20. I don't know. But that's the solution I came up with. I'm just having fun with these lights. It's just something completely different. That is it for what I have been showing you. Now let's talk about what you've been listening to. It is the Neumann, hello, Neumann, BCM 104. Not to be confused with the Neumann, hello, Neumann, BCM 705, which is their broadcast dynamic. The 104 is their broadcast condenser. I will have a brief back-to-back comparison on Podcastage 2 sometime while I am awaiting doing a full review on this microphone that I had <laughs> Editing Bandrew here. I am adding this in post-production. I wasn't planning on doing this, but hey, why not? This is going to be a quick side-by-side comparison of the BCM705 and the BCM104, just so you can hear it before the video goes live on Podcastage 2. Let's hear that now. This is microphone A, three inches off. Microphone A, three inches off. Jumping over to microphone B at the exact same distance. Here is how microphone B sounds at the exact same distance. Jumping back to microphone A, both of the microphones are running over XLR to XLR into the Universal Audio X8, recording 24-bit 48 kilohertz. Going to microphone B, the gain is set differently for both microphones. The 705 has gain at 55 decibels, while the gain on the 104 is set at 35 dB. Let me know which microphone you liked in the comments down below, and I am going to disclose which is which in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Microphone A is the BCM 105, which is the broadcast 104, which is the broadcast condenser. Microphone B is the BCM 705, which is their broadcast dynamic microphone. 35 decibels for the 104, 55 decibels for the 705. Which one did you like better? Did you guess right? Do you have one? Do you like one? Do you hate one? Let me know. While doing this test, I did encounter quite a big flaw with the BCM705, which I didn't stumble across when I reviewed it. It is a dynamic microphone, so technically it doesn't require phantom power, so I don't have phantom power on. But let me show you what happens when I turn on phantom power for this microphone. Listen to that noise floor. It becomes unusable, so the phantom power creates excessive noise with the internals in this microphone. So you cannot use this on a mixer or an interface if you're going to have phantom power on. And that would be an issue with something like the Focusrite 2i2 or 18i20, which is why I'm not using that. Because I need phantom power for the 104, but cannot have it for the 705. Let me shut it off now. I just had to share that because I stumbled across it while making this and I think that's kind of a big issue that should not be the case on a $700, $800 microphone. That should not happen. Now I'm right on top of the 104 and here is how it handles the proximity effect. 
And here I am right on top of the 705, and here is how this microphone handles the proximity effect. Now for a quick plosive rejection test on the 104. Please bring pizza pronto. Please bring pizza pronto. Please bring pizza pronto. And the 705. Please bring pizza pronto. Please bring pizza pronto. Please bring pizza pronto. Now I am typing on a keyboard with Gatoron blue switches, and here is how much the 104 rejects. And now on the 705, here is how much this microphone rejects. All right, back to the regularly scheduled podcasting content now. Fast Bandrew, take it away. That is not all that I am testing that you are listening to. I am doing something vastly different with the processing of this show. I am using, only using, the new Isotope VEA plugin. This was announced in conjunction with Earthworks. So Earthworks, if you buy, I don't know which microphones of theirs. I know the Ethos is one of them. But if you buy that microphone, you get Isotope Elements, I believe, and then this new VEA plugin. This plugin just has a drop down menu with a couple of presets and then three dials. The first one allows you to decrease the amount of room tone and reflections going on. The second dial just adds EQ. And this is where the biggest change is going to be from the presets or maybe the only change in the presets. But I found the basic EQ or the basic preset was my favorite. The others were a little bit less flattering on my voice. Again, I will have a full video on Podcastage 2 walking through all of these. And the final dial is just to boost the audio and make it louder. So if you want to loudness normalize or something, maybe you can't loudness normalize, but this will allow you to bring up the level of the audio. I will, of course, run this through Isotope RX-10 and level to the standard minus 16 LUFs. But other than that, the only processing I am doing, I'm running through the LA-610 Mark II directly into the Universal Audio X8. No processing in Logic, no compression, nothing. I am just running through VEA. Let me know if this sounds okay. Let me know if you think this sounds like garbage. Does it, is it acceptable? Is this too simple? I think it's neat, but we'll see how it sounds. That's the, that's the nuts and bolts of it. That's what really matters. Does this sound okay or does it sound bad? We will find out in due time. That is all I've been testing. Now let us jump to what you had to... First comment comes from Sean Milo. He says, buy nice or buy twice. Not necessarily top end, but definitely not entry level. Sean, thank you very much for the comment. I think that is a great consolidation of the entire idea and discussion that has been going on over the last week on this topic. I do want to push back ever so slightly. I am going to bring out the meme. I don't necessarily think entry level is always bad. I don't necessarily think that entry level always means you're going to have to buy twice. The meme, the Behringer XM8500, 25 bucks. It gets you a more than functional dynamic microphone. And I think this is something that could serve somebody for the entire recording experience they have for content creation, for podcasting, anything like that could also be the microphone that teaches them what they like and what they dislike in the frequency response range and help them identify where they want to go from there. I'm also going to break out the secondary meme here, and that would be the Shure SM57. I think this is a perfect embodiment of what you're saying here. This would be buying nice and not having to buy twice. This isn't top end. Nobody would argue that the SM57 is a top-end microphone, but it is also not entry-level. This isn't bargain basement prices. This isn't a best price situation. 
but this is a microphone that will serve you for your entire recording existence. It is durable. You're not likely to break this thing. And if you do somehow break it, I don't know how you would. You still have a very functional hammer, but it is versatile. You can find a dozen uses for this in a recording studio, electric guitar, acoustic guitar, singing, horns, drums, probably room mics, I don't know, and other uses too. So I think this is a perfect example of it, but I think budget gear, entry-level gear can also be very useful, very usable, and very educational for somebody to go through. Don't waste all of your money in the budget entry-level gear area, but it can be a good jumping-off point because it allows you the ability to learn what you like and what you dislike. Thank you very much, Sean. We have another comment on this topic from Hydroponic Guard. They say, at around 1630, you were discussing buy good gear that won't fall apart bit. Here's from perspective of a poor person. Don't buy new budget hardware. Buy older, used, more expensive, back then hardware. Best example is my current laptop and monitors setup being two used business monitors for around $200 in total, Samsung S24E450 and HP Elite Display E243i for curious ones, and a Dell Latitude E5480 with 32 gigs of RAM and i7-7820HQ for those who care about specs for $90. Living in conditions where even this is considered expensive has taught me the ways to maneuver and find ways to be happy with what I can get, and I am quite happy with what I can do with it, being 3D modeling and animating. Hydroponic Garden, thank you very much for the comment. I think that is great advice, and it is very insightful. You don't need to buy brand new. Buying used can save you a lot of money because you're allowing somebody else to encounter and incur that depreciation. Just like when you drive a car off the lot, it loses, what, 10% of the value immediately, 20% of the value immediately? With a lot of microphones, it's very similar to that. You're losing 10, 15, 20%. If it's a couple years old, it may lose 50%. So allowing somebody else to incur that depreciation allows you to get still very functional gear while saving a bunch of money. And you're getting higher quality gear that will be more durable, it's better designed, it should sound better as well. So I think that is very insightful and good advice. Again, I do want to bring up the issue with some used gear where there's a lot more counterfeits nowadays. A lot of Shure microphones are counterfeited. Sennheisers, Neumanns, Electro Voice. I don't know if Electro Voice yet. But I know Sennheiser and Sure are counterfeited quite a bit. So you still need to be very diligent in where you're buying your used gear from, but you can get some good deals and get some great gear for a great price. Thank you very much. Next, we have a comment from Rhina. I think I got that right this time. TechMed Rhina Richter. He says, hey, Bandrew, for me, implementing background music is a piece of art. When done nicely, it can support your content and back it with some emotion. In addition, it may also help to hide some unwanted background noise. If done poorly, though, it can be quite annoying. Rhina, thank you very much for the comment. I hope I said your name correctly. I think you hit the nail right on the head here. Choosing background music is an art. It takes time to master, and very few people are masters of it. If you want proof that it is difficult to master, just go watch YouTube videos with background music. Very few people can get it right. Another art that few people master is mixing in the background music correctly. Most of the time, it is way too loud, so it ends up drowning out the voice and being difficult to hear what is being said or they said it so quietly that it ends up sounding like a little bit of noise and it's just distracting. If it's not set perfectly, it is a disaster in my opinion. So those are two pieces of art that people have to master to do it correctly. It takes time. It takes practice. 
And that is why I'm not too critical of people who make videos with background music where it is not done correctly, because I understand how difficult it is. Not just selection, but also mixing it correctly. Maybe adding a bit of EQ, maybe adding a bit of ducking. And all of this is why I have never really focused on or included background music. I find it very difficult to choose the correct song to match the the vibe or the emotion of the video. I guess it's because my videos don't <laughs> my videos don't have any emotion. It's soulless emotionless <laughs> demonstrations and there's no well I guess I could just do some kind of 12 tone serialism in the background. <laughs> That's what I'll do. The calming 12 tones of Schoenberg in the background. <laughs> that would fit. <laughs> But that's why I haven't really done it. I think you hit the nail right on the head. It is an art to choose the correct background music. Next, we have a comment from Vern Levine, and he says, In November, the IRS delayed the $600 limit change, so the 1099k will go to eBay sellers who exceed the current reporting threshold of $20,000 and 200 transactions. Right now, it looks like it will be $5,000 for 2024, though that can change. Hopefully it will, because $600 was ridiculously low, and $5,000 is still pretty low compared to how it used to be. Vern, thank you very much for the comment and the clarification. That is fantastic information to have. If the threshold is going to be $5,000, I'll be fine. I don't have enough DVDs, t-shirts, hoodies, watches to sell to earn $5,000 on eBay. I want to point something out here, though, because I know something similar happened on the Cash App a couple of years ago, and there was a lot of confusion. People seem to have this idea of, if this is not reported to the IRS, I don't have to pay taxes on it. If I am paid $599 on the Cash App, I don't have to pay taxes on it until it gets reported. That's not how this works. That is not how this works at all. If you get paid $599 and it is actual payment, you have to pay taxes on that, whether the IRS gets a 1099K or not. On eBay, if you're making a profit, of $600 and it's not reported to the IRS, you still have to pay taxes on that. They just don't get the 1099K. So if you were to get audited and they found out that you got that money and you did not pay taxes on it, congratulations, you evaded taxes. So you do still need to pay taxes even if they do not get a 1099K. As I said last week, if you're buying something with post-tax dollars, then you sell it for a loss. My understanding is you don't have to pay taxes on it. But if you're selling it for a profit, you would need to pay taxes on the capital gains. If you are being paid for labor, if you're doing any kind of business work and you earn income, you have to pay taxes on that, whether or not it is reported to the IRS. If you don't pay those taxes, you are paying a day playing well, you're paying. <laughs> you will be paying. You are playing a very dangerous game, my friends. Pay your taxes because the last three-letter organization whose bad side you want to be on is the IRS. They will get their money. They will get it somehow. And if you owe them money, they will find out, they will hunt you down, and they will take it from you. The IRS terrifies me there's like, there's two levels of fear that I have. There's Satan, and then, <laughs> then there's the IRS just right beneath them. That's the order of operations of what I am terrified of. <laughs> Satan, IRS. So I will pay the IRS. I won't pay Satan a dime. Satan could go suck it. But the IRS will get their money from me. Not a problem. Happily, here's your check. Thank you very much, Fern. I appreciate the, the information. Next, we have a comment from Dejo Naga. I apologize for mispronouncing your name. He says, about the titles, maybe something like, I unmonetized my videos and this is what happened. Vomit, comment, keep, can't, sorry, shower, need. Dajon, Dajon, is that how you say your name? Thank you very much for the comment. That is a fantastic title. 
that title is so good that I yoinked it, I stole it, and I used it on the Clipscasted channel for the segment where I talk about what happened when I unmonetized my videos. I have to say, that was a great piece of value that you offered. You may think it's throwaway, you may think it's a disgusting title, but I got tremendous value out of that. I got a title that I would not have thought of. So if you have titles like that for any of my episodes, for any of my segments, leave those in the comments. That is tremendously valuable to me. It helps me so much because I suck at titles. This is Apple Podcasts rolling out transcripts for all podcasts on Apple Podcasts. That's what I'm going to be calling this episode, and that is not clickable. So if you have any suggested titles that would be more clickable for a segment or the show as a whole, leave them in the comments. That'll be a great weekly competition, a great weekly thing we can do. I'll have the regular episode title, and then a couple days later, after all the title suggestions come in, we can update it to something much more clickable and much more youtube for lack of a better word. Duh, John, thank you so much. Really great suggestion, and I stole it. Thank you. Next, we have a comment from Vid Mashup. He says, Bandrew, making some shorts from those older videos could make a huge difference in the numbers you get. Vid Mashup, thank you very much for the suggestion. I am sure you are absolutely right. Over the last year or so, YouTube has been pushing in the studio. Hey, if you want to grow your channel, do shorts. We've noticed that only creators who create shorts are continuing to grow. They've been saying that for a while, so they have made it abundantly clear. That's what they want you to do if you want to continue to grow and succeed on this platform. The issue that I have is I clip down this podcast into what I think is the most valuable segments, so it makes each topic its own standalone video. It makes it much more consumable. Then I upload that to the Clipscastage channel. I very rarely come across anything in this episode where I think, yeah, that 10 minutes can be condensed down to 30 seconds, and that'll be a short. Maybe I don't have the eye for shorts. That's very possible. I did hire a shorts editor for one episode, and then I looked at the numbers and realized, oh, that's the entire profit for the entire month. (laughs) This is not sustainable, so... I got one episode of shorts and then I stopped it. So if anybody wants to, if if you find a short in this, feel free to leave it in the comment and say, hey, clip this out and upload it as a short. Or if you are the most generous person out there, feel free to just make it a short and upload it. I don't care if you upload it to your own channel, if you send it to me and then I can upload it to Clipscat, do whatever you want. But I don't have the eye for it. I want shorts to be valuable. My favorite short that I ever made was on podcastage, and it was what happens when you, or why did that newscaster use a condom on a microphone? And it was difficult to edit that down to 60 seconds or 59 seconds because I made it 90 seconds for TikTok and Instagram. And then I had to cut out 30 additional seconds for YouTube. It was so difficult And the video didn't perform on YouTube. On TikTok, it got 250,000 views, I think, 200,000 something. On YouTube, 10,000. And no real growth to podcastage. I don't have the eye for it. If you see anything that would make a great short, let me know. That is it for what you had to say. Now we are going to jump to the value for value section because this is a value for value show. What that means... I do not put this behind a paywall. I put in the value that I can into each episode. If you get anything out of it, if you get any value, just return that value in whatever format you deem fit, whatever format you find appropriate. Because of these amazing financial contributors, we do not have ads. So if you enjoy this show without any ads, it is thanks to these amazing people. Number one comes from MEI Studio New York, a.k.a. PAGS. He comes in with 1999 USD and he says... 
Bandrew, you're a gentleman and a scholar. I'm sitting here with a 102 degree COVID fever, and this brought a smile to my horrific day. I've found that titles mean more than thumbnails. I used to title my videos like something shootout, etc. Started getting way more views by just naming the video the model of the mic I'm rocking with no other words. All my views come from YouTube search. Budget analyst. I wrote software to automate tax budgets for the government. Complex stuff. Really appreciate the shout out and your thoughts on my question. So no grindcore in the background? Got it. In my music class in high school, we did an experiment where we put circus music behind a Friday the 13th and to completely change the vibe. Thank you for the great video. Pags, thank you very much for the 20 USD and for that great feedback. First thing I want to say is I hope you are feeling better. I hope you were on the mend. I hope you were over the hump of COVID because COVID can suck a big bag of butts. It sucks, especially with a 102 degree fever. That is no fun. Rest up, drink your fluids, eat some chicken noodle soup, and watch some of your favorite movies while you drift in and out of febrile delirium on the couch. That's how I got over it, and I kind of dug it. It's because... (laughs) I I shouldn't say I dug having COVID. I just dug laying on the couch and napping for two days straight. That was nice. But I hope you're taking care of yourself and resting up and feeling better. As far as the views improving once you change the titling of your videos, I am glad you found the correct strategy for you. I find that very interesting, though. I wouldn't imagine that a simple title like Sure SM7B would perform better than SM7B versus this, 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 SM7B review slash test, SM7B demo, SM7B against the RE20. What what gives with the SM7B? If Jerry Seinfeld was reviewing microphones. But as far as the views coming from search, I have found the exact same thing with podcastage, and that is likely due to the fact that we are resource channels. We don't have super sexy topics that appeal to the masses. Nobody in the masses gives a heck about the 7B, the C414, the U87, the M160. They don't care. We are there for the nerds. We are there for the audio people who are looking to buy something new. We are there for the audio nerds looking to dive deeper and hear the comparisons between all the options that are available. Just because they're interested in it, that is who we appeal to. We don't have mass appeal. <laughs> so so the fact that we have a platform to upload all our videos and the information we want to share to is incredible to me. And it's even more incredible that there is a platform that we can upload to that people can query. They can find information on stuff that is so incredibly niche. And that is why I think YouTube is so incredible. Because dorks like us can upload what we want. And then when there's another dork out there who thinks, I want to know what that microphone sounds like, they can find us. It is a beautiful time to be alive because the nerds can do what they want to do. The nerds can nerd out on the topics they want to nerd out on. I love it. Pags, thank you again and please take care of yourself and feel better. Next, we have 10 USD from Robert Tower. He says, looking forward to all your experiments and the presentation of your ideas in the coming year. Thank you for brightening up my dreary Sunday evenings. Robert, thank you very much for the 10 USD and thank you very much for the incredibly kind words. I am honored that you spend your Sunday evenings with me. That really does mean a lot. As I say pretty much every single week, you could be doing anything with your time. You could be watching a movie, you could be reading a book, listening to an album, going for a walk, hanging out with friends. You could be doing any of that. So the fact that you are here with me just means the world to me. Thank you so much. And I also look forward to sharing all the information with you over the coming year. The last super thanks comes from tech med Reina Richter for 25 euro. And he says, Danke. Rhina, or for old sake, Rainer, thank you so much for the 25 euro. The fact that you continue to watch this show, the fact that you continue to support this show really means the world to me, and it allows me to keep the lights on, the lights colored, 
the audio sounding good, and the podcast hosting bills paid. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of the supporters because it allows me to keep the ads shut off on this channel. So if you enjoy this podcast without ads, thank you to them. Go ahead, thank them. I'll wait. Thank you for saying that. They really do appreciate it, and they deserve all the thanks you just gave them. That is going to wrap up for this week's episode. I have nothing else. No Ask Bandrews, no Movies of the Week, although I should bring that back. I found my old theme song where I screamed to my mom to bring me popcorn. She didn't hear because she's hundreds of miles away. I am still waiting for my popcorn. Perhaps I should bring back Movies of the Week or Music of the Week or something like that. But thank you so much for coming by. I really do appreciate you spending your time here. As I said, you could be doing anything. The fact that you choose to spend 30, 40 minutes with me does not go unnoticed, and I appreciate you deeply. I hope you have an amazing Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Next Sunday, I will be back. I will be talking at you. Let me know what you thought of the BCM104, and let me know what you thought of the processing with the VEA plugin. I will talk to you later. I love you. Bye-bye. Whoa. Whoa. Boop. This has been a Geeks Rising production. Your executive producer is Bandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.